Why don't we clap our hands mightily to the Lord? Somebody shout with a voice of triumph. Let's give him some high praise because he paid a high price at Calvary. Praise God. You can be seated just for a moment. I'm not much on um, on doing this, but I feel like it needs to be done tonight. I want to give honor tonight to the speakers that's gone before me. Great men of God, precious spirited men, and every one of them has preached tremendous without exception just tremendous preaching life-changing messages our God must care about us a whole lot to give us such ministry I want to give honor to brother Joel Booker youth committee I love brother Joel Booker he's one of my favorite people in the whole world I love his ministry and I love his spirit and I love his youth committee I love these young men Every Sunday morning, I go to my church early, somewhere between 5.30, maybe earlier some days. And uh, every morning, I I usually text several young men and uh, pray for them, pray over and over for young ministers, young pastors, young evangelists. Got such a burden for young ministry. I know the pitfalls that's out there for great young men. I know the other voices that are out there and I just pray that God would help them to hear him clearly and to be able to preach truth and love that truth. So I love this youth committee. I wanna give honor to the EC that's here, Brother Johnny King, Brother Larry Booker, Brother David Smith, and one of my close friends, Brother Kenny Godair, and then Brother Wilson, Bishop Wilson, not able to be here. God bless him. We got some honorary board members on that EC. Brother Floyd Odom, Brother Johnny Godair, and then Brother Crawford Kuhn, who is unable to be at at our events due to illness in his body. But I miss Brother Kuhn very much. I give honor to my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, my bishop, my pastor. Love him. And I don't know if they're listening tonight or not. But I'm praying for them. My children love my kids. Got two beautiful daughters. They live for God. They're serious about their walk with God. And then I got a son-in-law, Bill, who is more like a son than he is a son-in-law. And I appreciate him. But I got three grandkids that supersede. No, they don't supersede. I got three grandkids that I love dearly. They're listening. I, they t- they Facebook me and FaceTime me or something. I don't know what they did. Some face with it, but I saw them on the on the phone. <laughs> you could tell I'm really. <laughs> I could preach against it, y'all wouldn't even no difference, would you? <laughs> but they told me they was going to be listening to Papa preach tonight, and uh, I love them. Then my wife, I appreciate my wife. I love Connie Tiller. She's a great lady. These cadets have been great. Music's been unbelievable. And then Brother Hoffer, God bless you. I don't know where you're at, somewhere up there, but I love you. You do such a great job. Why don't we give HDR a round of applause? I want to give uh, Beth Erskine, I think she's still here. Her husband's not, but Ted Erskine's one of my dearest friends. And he did not choose to come. He says, I didn't need no help. But um, I appreciate his confidence. I, I just don't think he wanted to spend the 500 bucks for the plane ticket. But um, I love Ted Erskine. What a great opportunity we're living in. 
We've got world that's in chaos. Chaos. But what opportunity to touch the lives of humanity. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord. Won't you stand with me tonight? I'm going to go to the word of the Lord. Sister Booker, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Sister Booker, I'm glad you're here too. But Sister Brewer, we're, we're glad you're here. We love you and appreciate you so much. And um, miss your husband. God bless you. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. The Bible says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, Whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm going to give you the keys. Praise God, authority, power. I want to preach to you tonight on this subject that the Lord spoke to me several weeks ago. And, um, and I don't... I don't usually give weird titles or, and I know this is going to sound just a little bit off to some, but I don't mean it that way. I just mean it the way that the Lord gave it to me. But I want to preach to you tonight on this subject, a church stronger than hell. A church stronger than hell. Turn around to about three or four people, smile real big and shake their hand real strong and say, I believe what he just said. Now, why don't you lift your hands and your voice? Let the devil know you're redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah! Praise God, praise God. You can be seated in Jesus' name. The spirits of confusion are running rampant in this world. And they are, and they do, affect our church and our young people. And our people in general, spirits of confusion. Everywhere you go, you read about, or you see, or you hear about Bruce Jenner and his change, sex change, confusion, confusion. You read about mothers abusing their children, fathers abusing their families. Man, it's just confusion. Things are like Brother Endress said last night, completely out of order completely out of order you talk about men and women's dress in this last day no wonder deuteronomy stands out greater today than it's ever stood out when it talks about the distinction of apparel and men and women god says i want you to be distinct you don't need to be confused on who you are or what you are you just need to be what i created you you're not just something that was thrown out there. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God put thought into us. 
And we got a world that's trying to take away our identity of who we are. They want to confuse young men to think you're young ladies and young ladies to think you're young men. But I want you to know there's no confusion. You are what you are by the grace of God. God made you. That's what you are. God did not make a mistake. You are what you are. And I'm glad to be what I am. I'm glad to be what I am. And the spirit of the world calls us in some young men and young ladies and people a spirit of identity crisis. Don't know who I am, what I am, where I belong. You feel like you're missing out. Man, you get in the church and God blesses and touches and helps. And then you just kind of feel like I've lost my identity. When you don't go to a prayer room, you will lose your identity. When you don't worship God like you ought to worship God, you will lose your identity. You'll start thinking you're more like the world than you are the church. When you don't submit to pastoral authority, you will lose your identity. Instead of seeing a blood-washed child of God, you'll start seeing a lustful, perverted, liar, cheater. You're not like everybody else. You hear me, young people. You're not like everybody else. You've been born different. You've been born of the water and of the spirit. You've got an experience with God. You just didn't shake somebody's hand and say, I believe. You touched God and God touched you. Praise God, the way you dress and the way you act and the way you talk and the way you walk, what you listen to, what you watch, what you do, man, that's a part of your identity. That's a part of who you are. So you've got to guard your identity. You're not like everybody else. You're the church of the living God. I said, you're the church. It's good when we tell the adults that they feel the responsibility of it somewhat. But man, when you tell young people you're the church, it just kind of goes over their head and says, I'm glad to be a part of the church. You're not a part of the church. You are the church. You're not a second tier child of God. You are the church. If revival is going to be had, it ain't going to bypass you. It's going to go through you. If there's going to be supernatural works of God, it's going to go through you. It's not going to bypass you and go to your mom and dad. You're the church of the living God. The essence of the church. All through the Bible you see the Lord dropping hints of the church. And starting with Abraham, Abraham gives us a characteristic or an essence of what the church would be. The Lord said, Abraham, you obey me, you keep my commandments. Your seed is going to be like the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. Stars of the heaven speak of the heavenly church. The church right now, that's the stars of the heaven. The Bible said the sands of the seashore is the Israel today. But notice they came from the loins of a faithful man. A faithful man. He's telling us my church is going to be a faithful church. It's not going to wander to and fro. It's going to be a faithful church. It's going to be a church that I can depend on. That I can trust. I can put confidence in. I I believe there's some faithful people here today. It don't mean if I'm sick or if I'm well. It don't mean if I'm rich or I'm poor. I'm going to be faithful to God. It don't mean if I... I'm going to be faithful to God. Not just when I feel like it. Not just when everything's going my way. But in the good and the bad, I'm going to be faithful to God. The Lord showed us another semblance of the church when Israel was 
locked up in Egypt and they wanted to be delivered. And the Lord said, I want you to take a lamb of the first year and I want you to take that male lamb and I want you to gut it and skin it and then I want you to roast it. I don't want you to break a bone on that lamb's body. That lamb was a type of Christ. But more important, it was a type of the body of Christ. And the Lord said, I don't want the bones to be broken in the body of that lamb. Fulfilling the prophecy at Calvary. When Jesus Christ died, they came by to break his legs. So he would die quicker. Couldn't push himself up to breathe. But he had already died fulfilling the prophecy that not one bone would be broken in his body. I think the Lord has given us an insight that the church of the living God may suffer many things. But its structure will never be broken. Hell may have the power to come against us. Hell may have the power to come and fight against us. Fight your mind, fight your spirit, but it'll never break the church. This church was shown to us in the Old Testament as a transient church. It was always on the move. It was a cloud by day that led them and a fire by night. It was never stale, it was never stagnant, it was never still. It was always on the move. God's church is always on the move. God's church was a conquering church. As long as they obeyed the Lord, they conquered. They were victorious. Nothing could defeat them. Nothing could overcome them. As long as they were obedient unto the Lord. His church would be a conquering church. His church was represented as a golden candlestick. A golden candlestick that was pure as the gold it was made of. And the light was its purpose to shine forth. My you're caught up behind. The church was not just to be an entity without a purpose, but it was to shine light and it was to show the abundance of the power of God that worked within it. I'm glad to be in the church tonight. I said, I'm glad to be in the church tonight. We could be out on the street. We could be shooting up with heroin, but look where we're at. We're in the presence of God, where there's healing, where there's signs and where there is wonder. Hallelujah. In the book of Revelation, he still represents the church as candlesticks. Seven candlesticks represented the seven churches of Asia. But yet he shows us that he's walking amongst the churches. I want you to know this church ain't like every other church. This church has the presence of God in it. This and where the presence of God is, there is great things in store for those that inhabit the church. I wish I had some young people that would just lift your hands and cry out. I'm glad I'm in the church. Hallelujah. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, Israel has turned their back on God for other gods. He offered them rest, but they would not hear his voice. They did not want none of him. They were an uncomprehending people who did not trust the word of God. Israel's covenant with death, they made an agreement with hell. And lies became their refuge and falsehoods a hiding place. But the Lord saw that 
and he looked and he saw a remnant that believed in him, that trusted in him, that put confidence in him. And he gives us another glimpse of the church. He says in Isaiah 28, 16, therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He said, I'm going to put a foundation in my church that's going to be stronger than hell. He said, it's going to be a tried stone. We see the satanic ifs work against Jesus after 40 days of prayer and fasting. (laughs) The first trial of this great foundation stone. He said, Satan said to Jesus, if you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want to tell us tonight, if you would hear me, I want to tell us, Israel walked in a did in a wilderness for 40 years, eating manna from heaven. That was not the will of God. That manna should have lasted them about 11 days until they could get into Canaan land, into the promised land of God. But when their doubt came in and unbelief set in, they had to live on manna for 40 years in a wilderness. It was manna. It now became welfare food because they didn't have enough faith to put their confidence in the word of God. But the day they stepped into Canaan, uh, the manna stopped uh, and they began to eat the bread uh, and the corn uh, from the place of promise. Uh, You don't need to live on manna no more. You need to live on the fruit of the promises of God that wants to infiltrate your soul. We are not welfare people. We are people of promise. He said, cast thyself down. God will give his angels charge over thee. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is a tried stone. He said, if you will worship me, Satan said, I will give you everything. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. He's a tried stone. He didn't crumble under the temptations of Satan. He did not falter under the trials of satanic ifs. Then men tried him. When he hung on the cross, they said, if thou be the son of God, come down from that cross. And Jesus, I hear Jesus saying, the proof of me being the son of God is not whether or not I can come down, but can I endure? the cross if I can endure it hallelujah the proof of you being a child of God is not whether or not you can pray your way out of every trial but when God does not open up a way of escape can you endure it when God don't bring the healing can you endure it when God don't bring a deliverance in your family can you endure it That's the proof if you're a child of God, when you don't throw in the towel, when everything don't go your way, but can you endure? He said, there's some things I will never deliver you from, but he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. I want you to know I'm going to live with some heartache maybe, but I'm going to endure. I'm going to be faithful. I love God. I've been redeemed. You're the church. You're a tried stone. 
He was distinguished between the true and the counterfeit. There's many Christ in this world, but there's only one chief cornerstone of the church. He is the stone. He is the chief cornerstone, the precious cornerstone. The Bible said you put the strongest stone, you put the straightest stone at the chief corner because it's not only for the strength to support the building but it's to give it direction when you've got Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone you don't got to worry about this church falling apart in the last day but again you don't have to worry about it going charismatic neither You don't have to worry about this church falling apart under the trials of persecution or even tribulation if the Lord sees fit. But you don't need to worry about the church falling apart into charismatic doctrine or the emergent church doctrine or preteristic doctrine or the light doctrine. You don't got to worry. This church is built on a foundation with a chief cornerstone that's not only strong, but it's straight. And he said, this cornerstone, this foundation is going to be a sure foundation. It's going to be reliable in unreliable times. It's going to be firm in unstable times. It's going to be steadfast when everything else is letting loose. A sure foundation, reliable. There's going to come times when there's going to be people like Hymenaeus and Philetus who are in the truth and they're going to leave the church and they're going to try to take people with them. But Second Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, in spite of people leaving, in spite of people going crazy, in spite of people leaving the church, the foundation of God stand sure, having this seal. The Lord knows they that are His. Don't worry about your young people in your youth group. The ones that want to live for God, they're going to live for God. It don't matter who stays or who goes. If living for God's in their heart, they're going to live for God. Well, we lift our hands for just a moment. This foundational stone, this rock, this Jesus that we're preaching about is the foundation of the church. Psalms 118.22 says he's the stone which the builders refused, but it's now become the headstone of the corner. Some men ain't going to want to build on this foundation. Some people ain't going to want to be in the church. Some people ain't going to want to live holy. Some people want to trust in their own ways and in their own mentality and thoughts. But I want you to know there's going to be a church. There's going to be a church. It's not going to be a weak church. It's not going to be an anemic church. It's not going to be a frail church. It's going to be a strong church. It's going to be an anointed church. It's going to be a church with purpose. Who am I? 
Who am I? You're in the one God apostolic tongue talking holy living child of God with anointing enough to turn hell upside down. Jesus comes into Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi had been the center of Baal worship. It was the worship of the Greek god Pan that had taken place there. And then Caesar himself sees himself as a god. And he was worshipped there. (laughs) A heathenistic place full of ungodliness, full of heathen worship. Baal worship Pan worship and then man worship. What a mess. And in the midst of all that, Jesus says to his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, You're Elias, Jeremiah, or another one of the prophets. But Jesus said, Whom do ye say that I, the Son of Man, am? In the midst of a heathen world, in the midst of idolatrous spirits, in the midst of heathenistic views of Godship and deity, he says, Who do you think I am? Do you think I'm greater than Baal? Do you think I'm greater than Pan? Do you think I'm greater? And Peter said, I know who you are. I know you. I know you're not just a man. You're the mighty God in Christ. You're the king of all kings. You're the Lord of all lords. Who are you? Who do you think I am? He said, I know that you're the mighty God in Christ. You're the son of the living God. (laughs) You are Jesus. When we see you, we see the Father. And when we see the Father, we see you. You are Jesus. You and the Father are one. There's not a first, second, third. No, no, no. There's one God, Father in creation, Son in redemption, Holy Ghost in the church right now. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. I know who you are. You're the Emmanuel, God with us. You're the shepherd, but yet you're the lamb. You're the king, yet you're the servant. Uh, You're the creator, but yet you're the creation. I know who you are. It seems like every time God gets ready to show somebody something great, whether a revelation or, or a vision, and Zachariah wanted to show him a vision of the candlestick. But when he got to Zechariah, the angel said he's asleep. And the Lord said, wake him up. Shake him up. I got something to show you. So the angel woke him up and he showed him the vision. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus is transfigured, changed into a glorified body. Man, the disciples were in heavy sleep. They were sleeping. And when they woke up, they saw a glorified Jesus, a revelation of his deity. They knew him in his manhood, but now they're seeing him in his deity. God wanted to reveal something to them. God wanted to show them something that they never seen, that they never knew. And then the ten virgins, five 
five, five were foolish, five were wise. But when it came time for the bridegroom to come, they all slept. But there was only five that said, we've got more than enough to take care of us in case the Lord comes late. And they were asleep. You know what I'm trying to tell you is when God gets ready to reveal himself or show his people something mighty, the devil comes in to inoculate in them a slumbering spirit so they'll miss it. I don't want you to see him like he is. I don't want you to know him like you need to know him. I don't want you to feel him like you need to feel him. I don't want you to see him in the brightness of his glory. I don't want you to go any deeper than you've ever gone. Know anything more than you know right now. I don't want you to be ready for the rapture of the church. But I feel an angel in this house tonight shaking us and telling us to wake up. There's something God wants to reveal in a great measure. Let's praise him right now. My agenda tonight is not to make you shout. It's not to make you do something that you don't want to do. My agenda tonight and my prayer has been, God, help me to lead these young people to a closer walk with you and into your presence as close as we can get. Because when we get close to you, we're going to see you as you are. We're going to see you as a deliverer. We're going to see you as a healer. We're going to see you as a savior. We're going to see you as a heart fixer. We're going to see you as a lawyer. We're going to see you as a doctor. You're the mighty God in Christ. Mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He, the Everlasting Father, the King eternally, the Wonderful in Wisdom, by whom all things were made, the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. I said it's all in Him. The devils believe in God and they tremble. You don't think this church is strong. You don't think this church is powerful. The devils believe in the oneness of God and they tremble. He said, I know who you are. You're the son of the living God. He said unto thee, flesh and blood not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, foundation, this foundation, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, a church. It's the first time that Jesus or the word church is mentioned in the New Testament. It was called the kingdom of God. It was called the kingdom of heaven. But now he calls it a church. It's the called out one. It's those that's been called out of the bars and called to the altar of the Lord to pray through. It's those that have been called out of adultery and called to the church. It's those that have been called out of the world and called into the church. It's those that have been brought out, called out, called out. And they heard the call and they came answering the call. It's a baptized body of believers. It's the body of Christ. And they're born of water and spirit. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. 
they were in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. There was a baptism that followed because salvation alone does not come in just receiving the Holy Ghost. Salvation alone does not come when you're just baptized or when you've just repented. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and that's important you've got to have a supernatural experience with God and it's going to be a faithful church when you get that experience you're going to be a faithful church You're going to be a church that's healed and made whole. You're going to be a pure church. You're going to be a hated church. But you're going to be a called out church. You're going to be an illuminating church. And you're going to be a valuable church. You're going to be a strong church. And you're going to be a church with great revelation. You're now the body of Christ. Many members in particular, but you're in the church. (laughs) You ought to shake somebody's hand and say, I'm glad I'm in the church. Come on, you need to mean that. I'm glad I'm in the church. So now that you're in the church... Now that you're in this strong, mighty church. Now that you're living on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What's your purpose in this church? Because we got gates of hell we got to contend with. We got demons and devils we got to contend with. Let me just stop right there and tell you something we're dealing with right now. In the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, the sons of God, they begin to marry the daughters of men. I know some men feel like angels married women. I know it's the sons of Seth marrying the, the daughters of Cain. I know all that. I don't know all that. Whether you believe it's angels that's gone into natural women and they've had babies with them or whether you believe that it's the righteous seed that has mingled with the unrighteous seed. It doesn't matter to me because supernaturally evil giants were born out of those, out of those unholy unions. They called them men of renown, not because they were good. They were renowned because of the evil that was in their heart. And a few years later, God destroys the earth with them. But they pop back up on the other side of the flood. Because whenever righteous people begin to mingle with unrighteousness, we create giants. How do I get these giants out of my life? You starve them out of your life. You don't mingle with the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You may have to tell some of your worldly friends goodbye. You may have to step aside from some of your relatives. You may have to quit some things you didn't think were that bad. But I'm telling you, keep on mingling your righteousness with unrighteousness. There's going to be a giant that's going to be birthed. 
And that giant's evil actions and evil behavior will bring the judgment of God in your world. Young man, handsome young man, dating a worldly girl. That ought not be in the church. Never ceases to amaze me how our great boys in the church always lust after the girls in the world. But yet it's the boys in the world that lust after our pure girls. What's wrong with that? You guys need to get your eyes set. Some of the most beautiful girls in the world are in this building right now. And young ladies, some of the greatest young men ever in the world are in this place right now. You don't need to mingle yourself with the world. You'll create giants and demons that'll fight you to your death. But thank God there's a David. Thank God there's a David spirit that said, I'm not afraid to conquer the giant. Gates of hell. Talks about the underworld. Talks about the realm of darkness. Gates of hell. It's the atmosphere of death. An environment of death. The gates of hell. Place of chaos, havoc, gates of hell. The gates speak of the strength of hell. A city's no stronger than its gates. When a city's under siege, the first place that their enemy's going to attack is the gate. If the gate's strong, then the city's safe. If the gate's strong, then they're all okay. But if somebody outside is stronger than the gates they put up, then that city's going to be ravaged. And that city's going to be overthrown. That city's going to be conquered. The gates of hell. Somebody say the gates of hell. is hell's authority. Hell's power. Some have called it the city of hell. But I just want to say this before I go on any farther. In spite of hell, there will be a church. And in spite of hell, that church will thrive. Bible said in Psalms 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. That word turn has a dual purpose and dual meaning. It means that they will become hell. They'll become death. They'll become dark. They'll become havoc. They'll become, they'll become turmoil. But it also means that they were turned into it. Like cattle are turned into a corral. They were turned into it. A country, a nation that forgets God, a wicked people will be turned into hell. They'll live in the environment of hell. The Bible said multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. I want you to know that don't mean there's a bunch of young people in a valley somewhere trying to make a decision on whether or not they're going to live for God. That means that people have already made the decision. And they're living in the environment of their decision. There's people living in the environment of hell. A nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. Be turned into hell. Be turned into hell. It's a hell as a city. It's a captive. It's a captive's in prison. It's people locked up. A place where people live a dying life. Hell. Lost in every imaginable sin. Because they chose to make covenants with death and agreements with hell. Hallelujah. The Bible said this nation that forgets God is turned into hell. And a church that forgets God is turned into hell. Israel, you make fringes on the end of your garment and you put blue ribbon on the ends of those garments. Those garments were 
just to be worn. And those fringes worn by people of royalty or people of high esteem. But the Lord said, I want everybody in Israel to wear that fringe and to wear that blue ribbon. Because when you remember, when you see it, you'll remember the commandments of the Lord. And you'll do those commandments. And you will not seek after your own heart. And you will not lust with your eyes. If you'll remember the commandments of God. If you're not going to be turned into hell. You better remember Calvary. You better remember the blood. You better remember the glory of God. And once people end up in hell, then the only way they're going to get out of that hell is if there's a church strong enough to break them out. The gates of hell shall not prevail, shall not prevail, shall not overcome, shall not hold off, shall not stop. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. This church is moving now. This church is not stagnant. This church is not stale. It's not stationary. It's a moving church. Gates are stationary. Gates are defensive weaponry. But the church is on the move. The church is on the move. It's storming those gates. It's going to push through those gates. If sinners are going to be saved, it's going to be because there's a church. Baton Rouge going through all kinds of hell man Tony spelled right in the middle of it all down there and when I read the headlines of what was going on and I seen the Instagram of Brother Spells church being down there I can't remember if he was passing out water or doing something down there but all I could say in my spirit thank God there's a church I've got 60% of the young people I have in this conference have neither mother nor father that live with them. They are living with grandparents. They are living with relatives. They are here. And you don't know the mess that can get wrapped up in a kid's mind when they're not living with their parents. I've got young people here tonight that are probably more bound than what I realize. I've got young people here tonight that hear the voices of hell calling them. But all i got to offer is a good church for them to live in and a good church for them to be a part of. Because I know that... <laughs> I know that God's church is stronger than hell. I know the church is stronger. Let the economy go whichever way it wishes to go. Let the politics bounce whichever way they choose to bounce. Let the world go any direction it chooses to go. The puppet on demonic strings. Let it go. Let hell raise up. Let people get crazy. That's all right. Because there's a church that's stronger than hell. Let the enemy knock on the door of the church. Let fornication try to come into the church. There'll always be a Phineas that'll run back with a spear and, and, and ravage those that try to bring it in. You go on and hell rises up. It comes in like a flood. God said, I'm going to lift up a standard against it. You're going to know that I'm in the house. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm the church. You're not just a church. You're the church. 
you got power. Let me show you something. I went to Reynoldsburg 1999, 98. I had a Sunday school teacher. I thought she had the Holy Ghost. I know it was just kind of a weird situation. Got a nice lady, but she didn't have the Holy Ghost. I didn't know it. On a Wednesday night Bible study, I was teaching some things. And uh, when I got ready to pray the end of service, a little four-year-old girl walks back there, takes her Sunday school teacher by the hand, and starts praying with her. And before you know it, that teacher was receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. Four years old. Four years old. If a four-year-old that had limited knowledge of God can have that kind of faith. I'll tell you why hell's fighting so hard in your lives because he knows that if you ever get yourself on the right track that you're going to turn his city and his world upside down he knows that he knows that he knows it. he knows that if you ever understand the power you have and the strength of the church you're in he knows that you're going to turn your world upside down scatter us abroad that's all right we'll win sorcerers and witches we'll turn our world upside down you go on and do what you need to do devil but God a position and transition his church in places that will overcome the powers of hell you're not just going to run amok God's got direction for your life God knows where you're at right now Paul Dees preached to you direction this morning he told you to accept your call not be afraid of it but you're afraid to step out don't be afraid to step out God will direct you you're no longer of your flesh you've got to walk in the spirit and as many as are led by the spirit they are the sons of God Little old town where I pastor, and I say that respectfully. I love my city. But it is probably the biggest drug place in per capita in the United States of America. Heroin addiction, crystal meth, knock doors, and people answer the door with meth mouth, and that's what you deal with. Children messed up. High school messed up. Man, you're living in some mess. A few, few years ago, I came in there eight years ago, and I'm used to feeling the authority over my city in Reynoldsburg. And I believe preachers do that. I know when I was in Reynoldsburg, I felt authority over that city. I felt like I could pray prayers that would stop the onslaught of hell. But when I walked into Carrollton, I didn't feel that way. I felt overwhelmed by the spirits of addiction. I felt overwhelmed by spirits of doubt and unbelief. That city's probably got a thousand backsliders or more in a city of 3,000. Full of doubt, full of negativity, full of it. And I didn't know how to combat that. And all of a sudden, a few years later, I fought that. Try to help the church build it up, preach encouragement to them, taught them some things. But just about four or five years ago, man, I began to pray against these spirits. And I began to bind them up. Because he did tell Peter, you're Peter, you're the church. And I'm going to give you some keys. I'm going to give you some keys. You know what I'm preaching to right now? I'm preaching to some of the greatest young people in the world. But some of you don't have a clue how much authority you have over hell. So I begin to bind up. What do you bind up? Man, I bound up everything I thought needed to be bound up. I bound up the spirit of Jezebel. 
I bound up doubt. I bound up unbelief. I bound up the spirit of politics that run through our city. I bound up hate. I bound up bitterness. I bound up racism. I bound it all up. Then what did you lose? I'll tell you what I loosed. I loosed the power of God. I loosed prayer on that city. I loosed faith in that city. When other people said it was a burn over field, I did not believe it. I believe that a burn over field can bring forth some of the most beautiful vegetation in the next season. I believe that. I believe you got to believe when you're the church, anything is possible. I don't believe there's such a thing as a burn over field when it comes to God and his church. I believe there's just worn out preachers with doubt in their mind. But somehow or another, you better wake yourself up because God's wanting to show you something. He's wanting to show you his power in the earth. He's wanting to show you he can bind up the politics. He's wanting to show you he can give favor where there is no favor. He's wanting, you know why he's doing all that? Because they're souls. They're souls that need to be released from the gates of hell. I love Hope Corps. I think it's one of the greatest things that I've ever seen in my life. I love it. I love the education of the kids. I love to taking them to their ITW. I love all that. Then sending them home and working with the pastor. You know what? You don't need to be questioning that man of God. You need to be thanking these men that do it. I was hoping there'd be somebody shout on that. Somehow you got to get a Bible study chart in your arm. And when you don't think you can do it, you just get the teacher's manual. And you just read it verbatim, whatever. Just read it. Do it. I want to tell you something. Don't underestimate God's ability to move on you just when you put forth an effort. You're somebody. You're not like everybody else. If you want to be like everybody else with this Holy Ghost experience, then you'll have to, you'll just have to backslide a little bit to do that. If you want to be like the world, if you want to play organized sports and give yourself to that, get wrapped up in that. If you want to give your talents to that. If you want to get into Hollywood and if you want to get in, I know we preached all that and you know all that, but I'm telling you, you better be careful what you join up with. Somebody said, I don't mean nothing bad by this, but somebody said when Tim Tebow used to make a touchdown, he'd kneel down and he'd pray a prayer. And man, I heard apostolic saying, man, that's something. He kneels down and thanks God for the ability to score a touchdown. I got news for Tim Tebow. God don't give you the ability to play sports. He gives you the ability to serve him and to worship him and to praise him. You're not designed to be athletes. You're designed to be soul winners. You're designed to be world changers. That's what you are. Don't let the devil steal your identity. There's young people here tonight, and I know you've you've we've we've taken you from one end of the spectrum to the other, and these men have done unbelievable jobs. 
I am so thankful for their preaching. I'm thankful for it. But I know there's some young people here. And you're living behind some gates. Gates of insecurity, gates of fear, gates of failure. You're not going to tell me there's all these kids here and you've not... And there's not some in here that's fighting the porn spirit. I pray by now you've already prayed through all that, but just in case. Just let me kind of sweep up the scraps here. The value of a church, not just to this world to reach and to save. And God knows I'm not doing all I can do probably. I want to reach people so bad. I can't hardly stand the thoughts of somebody being lost. But that's not the only reason why God gives us the power. He gives us power to help our own. In Acts chapter 12, the Bible said Herod wanted to vex the church. He wanted to oppress it, suppress it, depress it, vex it. He'd already killed one apostle. Now he's wanting to kill another, Peter. He's the prize preacher. Herod thought if he could kill Peter, the preacher of Pentecost, then he can destroy a church. But this church ain't built on one man. It's built on a revelation and a message. And Peter was locked in prison. Everybody say in prison. Locked in prison. Sixteen soldiers rotated watching him, guarding him. And Herod thought he had destroyed the church. But all of a sudden, there was a church. Everybody say there was a church. That prayed without ceasing. And when we pray, it's not biblical for us to command angels to do this or to do that. It's biblical for us to pray. And God commands angels. God knows where they need to go and he knows what they need to do. So the Bible said the church prayed without ceasing. And the Bible said all of a sudden an angel appears in that jail. The power of a church. That angel breaks the chains. He tells his Peter to get up quick. And when he does, the chains fall off. And if you're here today and you've fallen a million times, then you just get up a million and one, and I think you'll be okay. But you've got to get up. I can't get up because I'm bound. When you get up, you'll break those chains. I don't think you heard me. You think you're bound with chains? Then get up. When you get up, the chains will fall off. I'm bound with this and I'm bound with that. Then get up. Don't just sit there and die. Get up. Don't just lay there and, for, and have pity on yourself. Get up. When you get up, those chains are going to fall off. When you get up, you're going to be able to lift your hands again and you're going to be able to shout and you're going to be able to dance. When you get up, you're going to be able to hear the voice of God clear. But you got to get up. Rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Get up. Get up when you're oppressed. Get up when you're suppressed. Get up when you're depressed. But get up. Don't lay there. Get up. You need to get up with a brand new shout. Get up with a brand new victory. Get up with a brand new song. Get up with a brand new dance. But get up. (laughs) 
and angels came and he smote him and he said get up get up quick and when he got up chains fall off a church army can't fight when your hands are bound a church army can't do hand to hand combat when your arms are shackled You need to break. You need to break those chains. But what if I get up and they don't come off? They will come off. But what if I get up and they still hanging on me? They won't be hanging on you. Because you're a church that's stronger than hell. You just got to keep getting up. He smote Peter and then he led him through the first, the second, the ward, and then he led him out into the yard and there was an iron gate. Some of you have come to that iron gate a million times, but that iron gate was locked and nobody had ever gone through it without a key of those in control. No prisoner ever escaped through that iron gate. But now you've come to that iron gate. You've come to this place many times in your walk with God. Just to look up and see that iron gate. And it reminds you of past failures. And it reminds you of things you've said and things you've done and things you've thought. And you just kind of bow your head and turn around. And say maybe the next time I can break through it. Maybe the next time I can get through it. I was, I had a lady one time. I had mentioned this years and years ago. And I had a lady one time come up to me. And she said, Brother Tiller, she said, every time I get to that gate that you talked about, she said, the devil reminds me of an abortion I had years ago. And she said, I just can't go on. I can't go on as long as he puts that in my mind. She said, what do I need to do? I said, this is what you need to do. You just keep need to keep walking. You just keep walking toward that iron gate. And when they did, that gate opened up on its own accord. I want you to know there's a church stronger than hell come on young people get a hold of it shake yourself there ain't always going to be somebody there to pat you on the back you just got to make up your mind you're going to get up And when you get up, you start reaching and you start teaching and you start preaching and you start reaching and you start teaching and you start preaching and you start reaching and you start teaching and you start preaching because you're stronger than hell. And if the world's ever going to be saved, it's going to be saved because of you. What's the church going to do about all this racism? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to knock down the gates of hell. And we're going to pull out the black man. And we're going to pull out the white man. And we're going to pull out the yellow man. And we're going to pull out the red man. And when they get in the church, we're going to be one body. Bought by one blood. Baptized into one spirit. In the church, there ain't no black, red, white, or yellow. There's one body. You're not better than your brother. And you're not better than your sister. We're one. Would you lift your hands with me?
and the church prayed without ceasing. Let's pray. Come on, you know your friends. There's a friends here you've got here this week. They're still locked up. Let's pray. Let's pray without ceasing. You've got some moms and dads here that are locked up. Let's pray without ceasing. I wish that this is a strong church, a faithful church, a powerful church, a revelatory church, an illuminated church. This church has a strong foundation. It's got right direction. It's got strength. And this church, when it prays, it touches heaven every time. Not just sometimes, every time. It touches heaven. I wish I had moms and dads all across this place. Lift your hands up in these stands and just kind of point them down over these kids. There's an anointing settling in in this place. That anointing's about ready to destroy every yoke that hell's trying to put on your mind and your spirit. But I wish every young person would lift your hands, whether you want to or just lift them and get close your eyes. Just open your mouth, just tell him how much you love him, if nothing else. But this church is a unified church. I got one more thing to say. I hate to stop you from praying. I hate to stop you from praying. But you need to hear this. 
And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go sit down. When I was 12 years old, my mom and dad started going to church. Mom and dad got the Holy Ghost. And so here I am, 12 years old, going to church. Little storefront. And um, I went to camp. They wanted me to go to camp that year. I had never been around nobody. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. felt uneasy, uncomfortable. But I went. And, and during one of the day sessions of that camp, a man preached. And he asked a question to several, to three or four kids in the congregation. He called up a young man and called to ask him to stand. He was popular with the girls. And he had a couple girls sitting beside him. He was giggling and laughing. And, and the preacher said, Dennis. Snaps to attention. He stands up. And he said, what's this church mean to you? He said, well, it's a place I go and see my friends and get to hear good preaching. And, and it's just, just a place I go. Called out another boy back there that's popular with the girl. And said, Randy, what's this church mean to you? Uh, 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 uh. Well, it's, it's, um, 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 well, it's, it's, it's a place I go and touch God and I feel God. And, you see, you can sit down. That's this prissy girl. Stand up. I can't remember her name. She giggled and beat around the bush. Well, I, I don't know. Sit down. And then he looked at an old boy who had been in the church about three weeks. Old military boy was there. You could tell he's just right out of the world. He said, Mike, what's this church mean to you? Old Mike stood up and said, it's my life. This is the question. What does the church mean to you? Let's lift up our hands right now. It's my life. Come on, it's your life. It's my life. It's not just a place I go. It's who I am. Yes, Jesus. You got a world to conquer, young people. You got a world to turn upside down. You got cities to influence. You got people to win. You got gates to tear down. Come on, you wasn't made just to be a stationary entity. You were made for purpose. You've got destiny written all over you. Lift our hands and our voices all across this place with a shout, with a victorious shout, with a victorious shout. I think we should pray together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Christos! 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 Oh,
Masha Al Yahud, Wakula Sakin Al Quds, Bashrara. 